Farewell, my friends. I go on to a better place. Gotcha. Today, I'm going to channel my inner Sid to create this customized Toy Story and Gundam crossover. I think Sid is unfairly villainized in Toy Story. When he rips apart his toys to create new toys, he's just creatively expressing himself via kit bashing. And that's the kind of creative expression that should be nurtured as an 11 year old. So like Sid, let's first decapitate this toy. Let's first decapitate this toy. We'll start by decapitating this toy. So after you decapitate all of them, remember that you only need one, so set the rest aside, and then use your imagination to envision what you'll be creating. Like a lot of kids in the US, my first exposure to Gundam was when Toonami aired Gundam Wing in 2000. As a dumb kid, all it took to get me amped was for a mech to show up on screen. But looking back now, if the slow politics and angsty teenage boys aren't your thing, then you should still watch it, otherwise... I'll kill you. Since then, I haven't really watched much more Gundam, but I'm still a fan of the model kits and kit bashing them into something else. I chose this particular mobile suit, called Zagok, because I love the claws on each of its arms. And if you've seen Toy Story, you know that the aliens worship... So yep, that's the concept. Why desire the claw when you can become the claw? Let's start with prepping the model for painting. I skipped filming the part where I clip out all the pieces and sand them because it's super boring, so I'm just going to start with taping up all the parts I don't want to actually paint. Oop. That means masking out all the joints and the connector pieces that would be hard to put together if they were covered in a thick layer of paint. Next I'm going to clean up some of the major gaps between pieces on the model, like this one on the pelvis. I start by putting a fine layer of this thin modeling cement between the two pieces, which actually melts the plastic and gets the two sides to fuse together. With the bead of plastic forced up between the two pieces, I use a couple sanding sticks until it's pretty smooth, but I'm not really aiming for perfection here. That's good enough. Time to paint. Let's go outside and get a tiny amount of vitamin D. I'm repainting the alien head too because the current paint job is pretty booty and I want to bring it up to par with the rest of the kit. I'm painting the pieces in white, gray, and pink primer and basically just choosing whichever shade is closest to the final shade I'm going to put on it. If the final color is light, I'll use white primer. If it's dark, I'll use gray. And for the purple pieces, I'm using pink. After priming, I'm using an airbrush for the rest of the painting. I always start and end each session with this airbrush cleaner to help prevent any clogs while I'm painting. With everything already primed in lighter shades, I'll be using this rubber black paint to begin pre-shading the pieces. Using a mixture of one part paint to one part acrylic thinner, I dilute it till it's about the consistency of milk, and then just do a few test strokes before I commit to ruining the model permanently. Like I mentioned earlier, what I'm doing is pre-shading, so I'm basically just looking for parts of the model that would normally have shadows, if this was a gigantic robot, which will help add some contrast on edges and between panel lines when this is all painted up with a single color. At this stage, it always looks like I've made a horrible mistake, but after covering everything in a few layers of paint, it'll actually start to look like some shading. For example, as I start to lay down some of this blue, you can still kind of see the dark shading areas that are left behind underneath. It's a pretty subtle effect, but I think it makes a big difference. I also added some dark blue here around the midline for some added contrast. Here's a little forbidden two for one airbrush technique. I like to tell myself I'm trying to preserve my paint when I do this, but I'm actually just lazy. Here's another little shading technique. I took some masking tape here and just taped off the top part of the pelvis, and then I hit just that top portion with a lighter shade of blue. The effect I'm going for is it looks like the sun is hitting just the top part of this piece a little harder than the rest of it. Oh, speaking of masking, there are some places where you really can't use tape because the curvature of the model is weird, so for that, I'm using some blue poster tack to mask around the eyes here. Since the eyes are already white, there'd be no sense in spraying green over the entire alien head. The result is looking pretty good, and you can see the comparison here between the original and the new paint job. But there's still a little bit of eye cleanup I want to do. I want to add a little bit of gloss white paint to make them really shine. I'll come back and paint the pupils in later, but for now, here's a satisfying masking tape pull. 
actually, I kind of like this soulless look. With everything all painted up, I got a little bit overzealous and decided to assemble it before actually top coating the model. This was a mistake. Our lives are in your hands and you have butterfingers? Here it is, all snapped up, but let me show you why you should seal your models before you get your dang hands all over them. Oh, is the specimen ready for cleaning? <laughs> He's for display only. Now that that's cleaned up, it's time to seal it so this doesn't happen again. I'm using, wait, roll that back. Yep, I'm using Pledge Floor Varnish with two times more shine to seal the model. That goes right in the airbrush, and I spray it on with several thin coats. This stuff smells delicious, but please wear a mask and only think about smelling it. I'm really dreading this next part, but it's time to paint on the pupils. I start with a pencil and just lightly draw where the pupils are going to go before I commit to it with black paint. If you're nervous or you have an unsteady hand like me, just try tiny dabs until you're finally at the size you're looking for. Not too bad. Look at that nice gleam hitting off that gloss paint. There we go. All that varnish meant for floors is now applied. Next, I want to build a claw machine diorama. I bet I could make a pretty good rocket using recycled... Oh, it's recycled day. Perfect. These two things I planted here will work great. I think with this water bottle I can cut off the top to make the cone of the rocket and then this other one can be the glass tube that you see the claw game through. Using a hobby knife I'm separating the cone from the bottle and by complete luck that's a perfect fit. I want the alien to look like he's bursting from the claw machine so I'm taking my knife and trying to cut out a jagged glass pattern as if he shattered it as he punched through. This can be kind of dangerous, so be careful and don't be a dumb dumb like me and try to creep your fingers in underneath where the knife is plunging through. That kind of looks like broken glass, but I think we can add a few more details here. With my knife, I'm engraving in a few more lines for a shattered glass effect. And then with this plastic panel or plot plate, I'm cutting a few support beams that'll attach to the side of the claw machine. You don't need to fully cut through this material, just a quick scoring with the blade and it snaps apart. These beams would be real naked without rivets, so I'm using some glue to act as a faux metal rivet after it solidifies. This is the first time I've done this before, so I hope it works. This was a lot quicker than actually trying to attach individual rivets, which is what I'm doing here. I probably could have tried the same glue technique here, but instead I'm using a sharp object to puncture a series of holes around the rim here and then taking sequin pins and gluing them into place. Sequin pins can be found at pretty much any fabric store, but they make great rivets and nails for scale miniatures like this. Next I'm using more plot plate to trim out the four fins for the base of the rocket. Using this template I freehanded here, I took a pencil and traced out the remaining three fins. All it takes is a gentle caress of the blade and the fins should just snap out pretty easily. Next I'm using super glue to attach the fins to the side of the rocket. If there's one thing I wish I had for this part, it would be super glue accelerant. Otherwise get ready to hold the piece steady for two minutes while the glue sets. For all four fins. Do very boring minutes later. With the fins on, it was time to start assembling it. Since this plastic is very thin and susceptible to heat damage, I decided to use hot glue. This is typically regarded as a bad idea, but I think I got lucky this time. The rocket still needs a cone on the top, and I had this plastic left over from a case of apples that I thought I could fashion into some sort of cone. I thought I had a really brilliant idea, and I decided to see if I could warp this plastic around this vortex using a hair dryer. Here, here are my excellent results. New plan, I'm gonna take another one of these apple domes and I'm just gonna cut down to the center point and then I can fold it over, sort of roll it into a cone. Nice. Again, I used some super glue to seal it up, making sure to get a lot of it on my fingers and then I held it again in place for two minutes. Too valid. With the rocket cone done, now it's time to actually make the claw. 
Since I create a lot of these pieces from just things I happen to have lying around, I don't expect this tutorial to be completely replicable. In general, I'm just trying to communicate the idea of making something new from the recycled things you have. In this particular instance, I used a few random Gundam pieces I had lying around, plus this little keychain. The important thing isn't that it's perfect, but that I didn't have to spend extra money to make it. And after hitting it with some chrome spray paint, it's looking pretty not bad. The glass on the claw machine was looking very dull, so I'm using this high gloss coating to add some shine. And for the body of the rocket, I'm using a Tamiya Oxide Red primer, followed by a much more vibrant Italian sports car red. And in this shot, you can see I left the top of the rocket open so the paint could fall through and render all that masking I did of the clear glass useless. After painting, I thought the whole thing looked a little bit too one note, so I'm highlighting the top areas of certain sections in pink. And it was at this point where I was pretty sure this video was going to get flagged for mature audiences. Okay, I definitely need to fix that, but for now let's keep going. Here I'm taking off the masking tape and the paper that I put on to protect the glass. You can see it worked out alright, but there is some red paint that snuck in through the top hole. Using some super glue, I'm attaching the two support columns I made earlier, and you can see the rivets I made using glue turned out alright. Okay, that rocket shape though. Colonel, you better take a look at this radar. What is it, son? I don't know, sir. But it looks like a giant. I'm really not digging that ridge between where I attached the head of the rocket to the shaft. So I'm using a strip of plot plate here to sort of give it a more streamlined design. Maybe it's better? For the nose cone, I'm base coating the whole thing in yellow, and then I'm using white paint to highlight just the tip. And lastly, I'm attaching the claw to the inside of the nose cone. For this, just take the hottest glue you can find and just squeeze it liberally inside the weakest plastic you have. That way, when it warps your plastic, you'll realize that your first nose cone wasn't that good anyway and you really wanted extra practice on making a second one. And with a few more dabs of super glue, the claw and chain get fed down the rocket and the nose cone is attached. Ooh, that leaves just one more thing and for that, I'm sorry, I'll need my blade one more time. I don't believe that man's ever been to medical school. And with the transplant complete, this is done. Roll the beauty shots. And that's it y'all, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed seeing me ruin this gun kit, then I suggest you lightly caress that subscribe button because I'm gonna do it again. And then in the comments, let me know what kind of Gundam crossover you'd want to see next. Or if you're into crafting, leave a comment about some of your favorite buildings from video games and movies you'd want to see realized as a miniature. Until next time, this is Stetson Studio, and it was a pleasure having you here today.